Welcome to the Magma Podcast, and in this episode, we're talking with the mega-talented artist, Lois Van Barley. Lois is a Magma user and digital artist who's been drawing her entire life. She creates character design work for clients all over the world and spends her free time making digital paintings and sketches. She's inspired a following of over 2 million artists and shares her knowledge of art and design for digital paintings using Magma and other tools in her free time. She's published three books, including her first book, The Art of Lowish, funded successfully on Kickstarter in under two hours. This episode will be talking about her career journey, tips from an industry leader in navigating a professional career in design, and how she's using Magma's collaborative design platform to engage her audience to give back to these creative communities. So stay tuned because this is an episode you don't want to miss on the Magma podcast. Hello and welcome everyone to the Magma Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in and welcome our very special guest, Lois Van Barley. Maybe Lois, the first thing, am I saying your name correctly, your last name? Um, it's Barla, uh, Barla. but it's, it's a very like kind of weird pronunciation. So you're very close. Barley is okay. <laughs> very typical American English uh, translation. I always try not to do like the A's or the E's, but that makes perfect sense. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Dutch is a tough for language. For so thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's our pleasure. Honestly, the you have such an incredible following. You're such a, a, a talented and impressive artist. And I think within the Magma community, we have tons of people that are interested in your work and, and those that are outside of it. And there's a lot that I'd love to get into in, in terms of career and success story and all these things. But I always feel like the first most important thing that I always want to know is is what where your artistic journey began. Like, what was the beginning stages of this? Oh, man. Um, so my artistic journey, I think I've been drawing like ever since I can remember. So for me, it was like from really the moment that I could hold a pencil that I was really into drawing. It was just my passion. I remember like making drawings for other people in kindergarten. I remember like being told from a super young age that I was a good artist. So it was always something that I continued to do because getting that positive encouragement had a huge impact. And I'd say like the way that I know it now, like the art journey that I'm on now with the digital art and the more kind of semi-realistic style that I work in really started when I was a teenager. So when I was around 15 years old, I discovered Art Nouveau and I kind of reconnected with my love for Disney. And I also discovered anime for the first time. And I joined a lot of like online internet communities where people were drawing in these really cool styles that I'd never seen before. And I joined those communities and started, you know, picking up my influences from there and playing around with like online drawing tools as well as Photoshop. And I became very like enamored with digital. And I guess that that's where my current kind of path began when I, mm. it all happened when I was 15. It was kind of a wacky year because like a lot mm. suddenly I can, occurred. I can relate to 15, uh, <laughs> the, those teenage years. It was, and that was when like digital tools were becoming available. You had access yes. to Photoshop and tablets and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. That was when like you could get the first affordable drawing tablets. Cause I remember having seen tablets 
like in some form when I was still in elementary school, but it was like being used in a really high tech environment. It was very rare to see. It was like on the production of animations. So I remember seeing it in a making of um, and just thinking like, wow, that's like it always stuck with me. Like it just blew my mind that something like that could exist because I was making a lot of digital art with my mouse as a kid, like in paint. Mm. Um, and then, you know, when digital tools like drawing tools became more affordable, I got like one of those tiny tablets that was meant to set signatures and it became wow. like my first drawing tablet. So having that available to me was a huge catalyst in like mm. making that happen. That makes perfect sense. And I think one thing I wonder is, because you know, there's a lot, I, you know, we all of us at different stages in our art journeys, particularly when we're going through the adolescent years and if you have skill and ability, it's super important. It's very important for you, for artists to be able to develop more quickly. But was there something in, in, in something specific at 15 or in the teenage years that kind of, because one thing to maybe unpack a little bit further is your, your artwork has such a, a life and style to it. it. It's something that feels very authentic to you. How did you start that journey and begin to develop this, this, this style and this focus? I think that really happened when I started just like mixing my influences. So I had like a bunch of influences that I was super passionate about when I was 15, 16, 17 years old, like in those years. And I just like mix them like pressure cooker style into like, I and I wasn't even thinking about like what is tasteful or what is, so like people who have uh, seen me talk about this before, they know what I'm talking about. But like, I used to draw Powerpuff Girls that were like in the style of like were Star Wars characters. So oh, like that's Padme rad. as a Powerpuff Girl. And I would draw like Padme in Art Nouveau style. And I would draw like My Little Ponies in like anime. So like I was mixing everything that I liked and just kind of like, I don't know, going, um, going wild with that. And I think my style kind of came out of that, you know, like this highly experimental time that I was just kind of mixing and matching different things and trying out new techniques and trying to find my way in that, you know, trying to make something increasingly sophisticated because the work that I was making at first was very like amateuristic and corny. And then like out of that grew something that was like a little bit more, like mature i guess and that's kind of what where my style came out of but when i look at my work now i still see those influences you know of like those you know cartoons and like my toys that i grew up with and just all of it mixed in there mm -hmm. that makes sense so it's sort of like an evolution of just where your natural in, in interests lie yeah. in, in that and you've just simply evolved that through you know training and education and, and learning to grow um yes. That's that's mm. how I look at it. I also think that it's like kind of a way of like, how do you like, what does art mean to you that has a massive influence on style? Because for me, art making art was always a way to like, relax, like it was very like soothing activity for me. It was a uh, like an escape from a lot of high pressure things going on in my life around school and like family life. So I think that that's a huge reason why my art has like kind of like uh, emotional um you know, themes in it and has something calming because it, it that's what it is to me. So th those things all kind of like formed for me early on, basically. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I think that's incredible that the the projection of the, the emotional, uh, I guess, journey that we all go through, particularly, I think many artists can relate to that in, in that, you know, the, the escapism that you get by being able to create your own worlds or, or envision something that, you know, maybe you're not able to achieve at that stage in your life. I imagine that there's plenty of people that can relate on that level. And it makes perfect sense. I, I'm curious to know too, in, obviously you had an interest in, in, in a particular style, obviously more stylized, it sounds like, um, on that journey, did you, did you kind of go through this on your own? Did you self-educate? Did, was there any, did you have any mentors or people that kind of helped you get to this place that you're at now? Um, I think I was like mostly self-taught, like for the kind of stuff that you're seeing in this slideshow, like my personal digital art, I really taught myself how to do that. Um, just by kind of experimenting with, you know, the medium and I'm just like very, 
I, I don't think it's something that like I think a lot of people wear as a badge of honor. But like for me, it's not really intended as like a, a brag. Like I taught myself. It was more like I'm just really inflexible and like not good at picking up new techniques. Like when people explain some technique to me, I I don't I don't get very curious about it. I find it stressful. So once I when I was first working with digital media, it took me a while to find like a workflow that wasn't like pure frustration for me. And when I found that workflow, I just locked into it and never really left it. So um, and I just was very resistant. Like, I've, I think I've only used a couple of tutorials in my process that helped me and other tutorials like somehow just didn't get in. Like, I'm very I don't know, like I I'm not good at picking up new techniques. I did go to animation school, which helped me a lot with like not necessarily digital painting, but like a lot of other stuff that was like formative to how I view art, right? Because it taught me to think in terms of like shapes and in terms of movement. And it taught me how to think about like the intention behind my work and storytelling. So it had a huge influence on my art, but like the technique itself of working, you know, of using digital media to create illustrations and digital paintings is, is something that I really taught myself. And I, I also really think it's important for people to work in a way that like, you know, like allows you to be intuitive with your process because that was not essential for me, especially for people who are like not so technical when it comes to art. Like I, I've tried to learn, like, I think I could learn perspective, you know, if I really put my mind to it, but like a part of my brain just doesn't like finds it overly technical and doesn't connect well with that material. So I intentionally seek out intuitive methods for creating art. And I think that that's like a valuable technique for those of us who are less technical when it comes to art. And that being self-taught kind of taught me the importance of that, like using your intuition, your gut feeling, finding something that just works for you and rolling with that. Um, yeah, it's been really important for me. That's that's really fascinating. I think and in, in, uh, we are going to be opening up to questions here soon. So I know that there's there's a few in here already uh, here. Maybe this is a good one before I go into some things. Eden had a question on how useful did you find studying animation? Yeah, I so I found it really useful for like, especially those underlying intentions behind creating art, because animation is so much like, it's such a time consuming and difficult process. And you really have to be super committed to your idea. And you need to really um, explain your idea well and carry it through to the end. It taught me so much about like, how do I like kind of come up with ideas and how do I explain them to others? Uh, Cause my teachers like by default, you know, were never impressed by anything I made. So I had to like fight hard to get their approval. Um, so I really learned how to like explain myself and justify my ideas and creative choices. And like, of course, technical knowledge around animation. Um, but I did find it like kind of weird in the end because um you know, I believed that the kind of work that I was making for myself, so like the semi-realistic, very feminine, colorful stuff, like the digital paintings, I thought that that was like a useless skill to have because I kind of picked that up from animation school, like that it wasn't, you know, it's difficult to animate that stuff. At least nowadays you could. There's a lot of beautiful like animations like Arcane, for example, that use a painterly Absolutely. style. But in like 2005, that wasn't really a thing, you know? So it was really like, you know, I was really encouraged by my teachers to move away from this sort of stuff and learn animation techniques so I could find work in animation. And then I graduated and then I ended up just doing the digital painting really primarily as my work. So I ended up becoming a concept artist and it does sort of feel weird to have studied so long to become very like, you know, to, to learn a skill that I ended up not really using as much as I thought I would. Um, and I do think that I could have taught myself everything that I kind of learned in art school, except for the the social part where you really have to like, you know, explain to your teachers what you're thinking and get criticism and like grow alongside your, your classmates. So I think it was like a super valuable experience, but at the same time, it felt out of touch with reality, with my reality, especially like it felt like, um, like it wasn't like a good real life indicator of how my future would look, but I, I guess, it's also impossible to expect that of art school, but yeah, it's sort of like a, yeah. a, a mixed feeling on, on the, my experience. There's a, I would maybe to add to that or build off of that a little bit. It's there's something to, I, I'm observing that you have this uh, innate 
ability and like direct like a ability to kind of self navigate you had a a a drive or a, a motivator that's kind of propelling you through all this and and, yeah. and 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 it's a very strong one which a lot of artists i mean the, that it, the, the spectrum is wide from people who have that to to not having that but still seeking to have a career or to be just simply be able to do what you do um maybe something that ties into this i i think a little bit i wanted to uh refer to the chat here again real quick but what do you think what do you think that is like if you could describe that and, and share some bit of that energy with somebody else who might be seeking to find that have you have you discovered what that is yet inside of yourself that kind of keeps you going i mean do you mean like that drive to do it my own way yes yeah, because like I do think that there are different kinds of artists, right? Like I'm very like stubborn and I want to do things my own way. And I'm I really value like my independence and being able to make mis make mistakes on my own terms. So I don't like it when people interfere too much with what so art school felt a lot like interference that I didn't want, <laughs> even though I willingly signed up for it. Um, and then there are people who need like the structure and the feedback and the community, and they need like to feel like they're doing it together with other people and they need somebody to tell them what to do and how to learn, give them more direction. Right. And that's also like those, that that's like really valid and really helpful for art school. So, um, and, and what I mean is that's really helpful to go to art school if that's your way of learning. Um, for me personally, I think that drive comes a lot from just, I don't know, just, I think a mixture of like not being very good at picking up new knowledge from learning material while in a classroom and also like having found a way to navigate life by just doing it on my own terms. Cause I remember like in high school, I would like in the classroom when we, you know, I did um, international baccalaureate, which was really like competitive high school degree um, that really preps you for colleges and stuff. So it was like a lot of work, but I remember going to the class, like going to class and not being able to focus on what was being said. Like I just couldn't concentrate. And as soon as teachers like explained a bunch of stuff to me, I had a really hard time just paying attention. So, but I was a really good student because I would just go home and like study the material by myself. And then when I was studying alone, I did, a, I could pick up the knowledge and absorb it and really like, you know, digest it. And so, and I got good test grades because of that. So, um, so I feel like I learned in that time that like, I need to do things in my own way in order to succeed. And that if I depend on like an external environment to guide me, that I will have trouble focusing on it or connecting with it. So that's kind of how I approached, um, that's how I approached art school as well. And in high school, I just spent like class, like at, at some point the teachers got used to me just laying out my sketching materials and just like drawing during yeah. class. Like that, yeah. that was like, I would just draw and they would be like, you know what, whatever. She like, she, in the end, she learns the material. So we'll just let her be. Those are really great teachers. I appreciate that they, uh, that they <laughs> yeah. allowed you to do that. <laughs> I was really lucky. Like they understood that I was committed, but I had a different way of learning. I just, yeah. I don't know. I think, that's I think... a great teacher. That's a really great teacher. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's good information to share with others and maybe to, to kind of tie this one up. Tangerine Chant had a question on this. If you could give your younger self when you first started drawing, feeling the struggle in the art journey, any advice, what would that advice be? Oof, yeah, I think about that a lot because when I first started out in my art journey, I felt very like excluded from it. Like I felt like an outsider and I also felt like there was a lot of like special knowledge that I simply wasn't getting. So I would like download certain software or brush sets and be like, this will make it work for me. And then I would try it and be like super disappointed that, that wasn't working. And I went to art school and it was very like, this is good art and this is bad art. And I was always like feeling like I wasn't fitting in on the correct side of art. Um, didn't fit in with many of my classmates. So I struggled a lot with feeling like what I did wasn't real art and that the techniques that I used were not like valid techniques. And now being where I am today, I can see that like they were oh, like perfectly valid and that there's like no like secret society, like gatekeeping what is acceptable and what isn't, you know, right. and that a lot of that anxiety just came from like being unsure and scared. And, um, and that it's okay. Like I always try to tell artists, like 
I try to give people permission to just do what they like. Um, because a lot of artists go through a process, art school, and trying to get into a certain career field where they start to like kind of disconnect from what they love and what they what got them drawing in the first place because they want to succeed and because they're told by people like this is unacceptable. So let that go and change how you do it. And you lose the connection with like the passion and the stuff that drew you towards art in the first place. And then and that makes it really hard to create because creating is like a deeply personal process. So maintaining that connection with what you love is like really important to be able to continue creating in the long term. So to my younger self, I would give myself permission to just do what I like and to just not worry so much about whether other people approve of it because like I just didn't have, I hadn't found my clan yet. You know, I hadn't found like the yeah. people who understood what I was doing yet and Absolutely. I would eventually find them. That's really great advice. I And maybe to, to explain, because I, I was starting that journey at the same time as you, the, you know, in the mid early two thousands and so much has happened, at least in the professional industry, you know, going to school, going to college for animation and, and studying these particular workflows. So much of that was defined by the status quo of just the industry. And the industry was very specific in terms of the types of things that they teach, the types of people that are teaching character design and, and techniques for character design. And there was flood, it was just a flood of people coming into this industry because digital tools were more accessible. People could create art more easily. Information was more accessible. You've got YouTube, you've got all these things. And if you kind of walk back and look at the trajectory of how art kind of blossomed in that, that 10, 15 years, uh, gosh, I guess, is it 10, 15 years now almost? <laughs> yeah, it is. 20 um, even. Yeah. 20, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the what what that did to the I think the psyche for for young artists that are going through college to your point and needing to fit into a particular mold and for somebody like yourself that doesn't really allow you to form in the best possible ways because it goes against your own natural instincts and your abilities and mostly your desires like you very clearly don't want to be a technician you have you are an artist you want to create in your ways. And I think that's a, an important aspect to remember for anybody is that, you know, you can be an artist and we've talked about this in other episodes, but you can be an artist and, and seek to have a career in art, but that what you do for work may not always be what you want to do for yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's important to keep like connecting with like your own artistic practice next to whatever demands are being put on you from your career or from like your school or whatever, like you, if you want to be like a commercial artist, you're going to have to adapt, you know, to like a commercial art setting in, in some form. But the thing that kind of keeps it worthwhile is that like personal connection that we have with our art, like our own reasons for doing it and the stuff we want to make for ourselves. And it's important to keep making time for that, however small, you know, because it, it keeps our creativity going and it, it maintains our identity as artists. Because I think like there is a stereotype that artists, you know, like live and breathe art, like that it's their full identity. But I actually think that artists are like at a quite a high risk of being like, you know, shaped into something they don't want to be like, you know, that, that, or that your art is like kind of, you know, that you have to do something with, like, I've seen a lot of people that like just wanted to be artists, like 2D artists make drawings and go into like graphic design or something because they think that that's like how they should be. And so artists, like your, your artistic identity goes through like a lot. It gets like, it's put under a lot of pressure and it's really hard to protect it actually. So I think that that's something that's important for artists to do. Mm, that's really good advice. That's really great. It's one of the, to your point on, you know, the, the, the need for artists to be more protective of their identities, especially today. One of the things I, I do love and experience while watching people using magma and the way that magma kind of works is that it's, it's less about uh, it, it, especially at this stage, it's, it's more about the communal collaboration and connecting with other people and, and learning to evolve kind of within your, as you kind of mentioned earlier, within your group, like the people that, that you identify with and it, that social aspect, you know, I remember what it was like being isolated. Like I didn't have any friends that, that really were interested in the same stuff that I was. So I'd spend a lot of time like in my room, just drawing and like on my computer, you know, I was doing like ZBrush and Maya in like high school, just because like I was trying, I was curious and 
I didn't get to share that with anybody. And it, and it yeah. was many years of isolation. And, and then when I finally got exposed to my bubble of people and went to college for animation, it was like I found my group and I was able to grow. But yeah. now you can achieve that from anywhere. And I think that kind of points to just the, the value in seeking to do those things, the more communal aspects and connecting with other people as well. Yeah. Yeah. Connecting with people is so important. For me, it was like absolutely formative because in those, in that super high intensity year of my life, when I was 15 and I was discovering all those influences, I was also like in sort of online communities for the first time in my life that like were sustainable. So I've been in online communities in some form or another, you know, from quite a young age, but this, I, I joined like these drawing board communities that we all stayed on for years and some of which I'm still in touch with. So that we all kind of grew together and it was just really important. And then later I joined DeviantArt and on DeviantArt, I felt like, I sometimes felt like they were the only people that got what I was doing, um, that like fully understood, you know, right? Um, because DeviantArt was like this place where people were just... I don't know, there was a certain style there There was like that I really related to, like this cool kind of anime, colorful stuff, like kind of nerdy, you know, everybody's just really nerdy together. And I really struggled to find people like that in my direct environment. So, and I think that like having that community on DeviantArt is one of the reasons why I continued to draw like stuff in my own style throughout my college years, even though my teachers wanted me to not draw in that style or like they wanted me to step away from that style for school. And I would have like believed that that was something that I had to do fully unless I, except if it weren't for DeviantArt kind of like showing me that it could be different and having a group of people who cared, you know, about my personal work. Cause I really just had no one in real life. I had a couple of friends from art school who liked it, but I, I just didn't have like enough, like, big influences in my personal life in real life to support right. like that supported my own style it was really only on deviant art that i was having wow. that for a while that's super cool that's such a great window back in time remembering what it was like when deviant yeah. was out and, like, <laughs> it was such a great it, a it really it was it is but it was so i mean look at it now look at like how many platforms yes. exist where art is yeah. shared and, and so many different styles and things can exist i think that's really amazing um yeah I, I, I sorry for anybody in the chat. I wanted to make sure I highlight a few things. Uh, Moonboy had a question on um, studying objects that align with your interests, for example, flowers, fish, hair, instead of trying to push yourself to get out of your comfort zone. How do you feel about these things? I think it's like a complicated issue because um, comfort zone is not necessarily subject matter, right? So you can be like really interested in certain subject matter, but that doesn't mean that everybody in everything in that subject matter is automatically your comfort zone. Like, I think that if you really like nature themes, that there are still like specific subjects that you could draw that are like challenging or very different from what you know. Um, so, but I do think that it's important for artists to like kind of know what is, what do you love to do? Like what gives you, what is soothing? And the comfort zone for me is very much like, a zone in which you're using like a workflow or technique or drawing a thing that you're very comfortable doing and you don't it's, you're not just fighting with the medium but you're just like able to relax while doing it and it's like soothing for you because you know what you're doing because you've done it before and then and that could be like any combination of things and you have to kind of know what that is and you also have to know like what's outside of your comfort zone that is like relevant to your interests that you can kind of like go into and try and learn more about to kind of expand your comfort zone but i think the comfort zone is also really important in terms of like knowing when you are overwhelmed and you need to return to it for a little bit to recharge because i i think a lot of artists get like stuck in a loop of kind of hating their art or feeling incredibly disappointed by the outcome because you're kind of in over your head. You don't know what you're doing yet. Um, artists are very ambitious. They set goals for themselves like, oh, I want to be able to draw this thing. And then they try it. And it's like, obviously not that great because it's their first time trying it. And then they might like keep pushing themselves in that area and get into a feedback loop where you're constantly not liking what you do and then you're disappointed over and over and then you start to fear that disappointment and then every time it happens that becomes like your primary emotion around drawing and a lot of people who have that like quit drawing for a while you know or they they call it art block 
So yep. art block can be a bunch of different things, but like one of it is not being able to draw anymore because you're stuck in a negative loop about your own work. And that's why it's really important to know like what is your comfort zone and how can you return to it when you're in that loop so that you can feel a bit better about your own work again. Um, and I think that that is like, it's a balance of constantly trying to seek out like, because if you stay in your comfort zone too much, you're going to get bored of your work and you might not have any ideas anymore. And that's also a type of art block, right? That you're like out of ideas on what to do because you might not have experienced something new or exciting or challenging in a while. So it's good to know, like, it's good to troubleshoot when you are in need of like expanding your skill set and seeking out new and exciting things. And when you are in need of like just sticking to what you know and feeling a little better about your work and just using art as a way, like to remembering that art should be enjoyed to some extent as well. So I feel like both are very important and I feel like we constantly have to cycle between them. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the time it's kind of like, the whole rhetoric of pushing yourself to always be learning and growing is exaggerated. I feel like that's important, but it's not like the the permanent mode we should be in um, because it makes artists feel terrible about themselves sometimes to always be yeah. doing things that are like out of their element uh, or overwhelming to do. It's such a good point. And uh, it, you know, I've, I've been a teacher for a long time in design. And one of the things that you said on f feedback loops is something I use all the time. Like, understanding this idea that you, and I think this applies it's not just about art it applies to pretty much every aspect in life is that we have to set ourselves up for success and and that could be any task that we'd like to achieve but in order to achieve it we it, and it's hard these days with social media and and particularly in art because we see so much amazing artwork and we just want to do those things and but the right setting up yourself mentally speaking for the right practice is more important than actually executing the thing in my opinion like essentially just being able to to be realistic with yourself it's okay if you can't achieve something like you need to set yourself up for positive feedback loops the thing that you the time you spend on a thing even if you don't achieve the goal exactly as you as you maybe intended you should probably set that goal within your mind to say, I'm I'm practicing this. I'm not the best at this. I will continue to get better. And each time I do, I will get better. But it's it's all about the the I guess the expectation that you set before you begin that journey. Right. It's like you have to give yes. yourself a little uh, a little grace, you know, to just like to fail and, and go through stuff. But yes. and learn to enjoy that part, because honestly, that, you know, so, not everyone has uh, the natural skill and ability to just whip something up and do it. Some people do, and it's frustrating for those of us, myself included, who has some have some skill, but always had to work for it. You know, like I got addicted to the work part. I started to enjoy the working. I love being tasked with the thing that I don't know how to do it and figuring out how to do it. That's oh, yeah, really yeah. fun. But yeah. other people, it's like you want to just pull your hair out, right? That's me. I would be like, no. <laughs> but that's the thing. I think like some degree of self-awareness is very helpful in that case. You know what I mean? Because like, you know, like what works for you, you know, what inspires you. And it's okay to lean into that. Yeah. Um, I think we artists have a lot of role models, you know, and there's a lot of like artists out there who are like, this is what you should do to be a good artist. And that might not always fit with you. Like you have to kind of think about what, what works for you, what inspires your creativity and what makes you want to learn and setting attainable goals is a huge part of that. Like setting goals that are, that are like realistic, you know, cause if you keep setting goals for yourself that are like absolutely unattainable, like I'm going to be like, like you're a beginner and you're saying, I want to be pro level by the end of the year. You know, that's like such a hard goal. And those goal posts are always going to be moving. Um, but if you say like, well, I'm going to practice, you know, like a half hour a day, that's like, you can do that. You know, you can, you can allocate the time or at least it depends on the person. Some people don't have that much time. It, obviously like you need to figure out how much time works for you, but it's more like, um, setting time is something that is more manageable than setting the goal of like, my work has to be of this quality, which is a lot harder to reach. So I think that that's really important part of like replenishing that, um, like breaking through that feedback loop and making it so that you feel good about yourself because you did the thing that you set out to do. Right. Right. Now it's such a great point. Like the, and I feel like we're unpacking a lot here, but I think it's incredibly important for particularly developing artists, but this idea of like, of knowing oneself, like we talk about this a lot more these days, is knowing yourself. And some of us are going to be 
frustrated at not being able to achieve something that's and you can't always you can't just flip a switch and just not be that way that part of it is who you are yeah you can start to exercise those things out by practicing a different mentality to anything that you're doing but it's like at least understanding your own your own pitfalls and being open to to criticism and, and maybe wanting i guess you have to have a desire to want to maybe change those things but if you do anything is possible in any one of those, you know, perspectives, you know, my, I, I like the work part, I have a little bit of skill, but I have to work really, really, really hard to get something that I'm happy with. And I have had frustration, absolutely. But I've learned to enjoy that process. But it took a lot of practice to get there because I had a lot of yeah. a lot of bad thoughts in, in just, you know, setting success as the 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 goal it's like i just yeah. want to be an artist in the industry and i came to learn over 10 or 15 years that that actually never fulfilled me it wasn't about being in the industry yeah. it was about i through that journey by setting that kind of superficial goal i'm not saying that it's superficial for everybody for me it was um but it but it ultimately un opened my mind up to the fact that i actually missed out on a whole lot of uh, core creativity that I could have been focusing on evolving my skills and my style and my things, but instead I set my goal as something else. And ultimately I, I lost a lot of, you know, creative energy and I kind of got that art block, you know, and I know plenty yeah. of people that go through that because of those, those things. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a familiar story. And it's also one of those examples of how like your goals can change the more that you learn along the way. Like you can think that like this is, and I think that it happens to a lot of people who decide at a young age that they just, they want to be something. They're like, I, my dream is I'm going to grow up to be this. And then um, you set out to do it. And like, I think that in like a lot of young people kind of like learn as they go that like their idea of the future doesn't match reality, not in the disappointing sense. Like for me, it was like, I always thought that, um, you know, I had a kind of a couple of positive revelations. I thought that uh, you couldn't make a living as an artist. Like I was told that that was not possible from the tender age of six. I had people yep. around me like you can't make a living as an artist. So I was like set on being anything but an artist. So it spent like most of my high school years thinking about what else I could be. Um you know, ranging from historian to philosopher to biologist, like thinking about all these other things, even though I just wanted to be an artist and now I'm making a living as an artist. So I know that that's not true. But I also like had ideas about like working in the industry. I thought like I'm going to work at a big company and like, you know, I'm going to work at a big animation studio and like work my way up there. And now like my whole idea of what it means to be successful has changed a lot because like I am so stubborn and independent. I don't think I could function well in that kind of setting. And I managed to find a way for me to do it on my own by being a freelancer. And those are things that like you literally can't think, you, you don't know that like those, that your goals will change as new knowledge comes in. And like you said, like you kind of reevaluated what fulfills you, right? That Those are things that happen along the way too. So it's always good, I think, for creative people to like recalibrate and like accept that like new knowledge has changed your ideas of what it meant to be creative or to be an artist. And for yeah. example, I also had like an injury when I was uh, starting out uh, as an artist that kind of like spooked me because I thought like, oh, I'm if I have this again, I won't be able to draw in the future. But, uh, you know, well, so I had it? to change Did you get my like tennis elbow or like. Yeah, I got tendonitis yeah. and the whole like uh, it changed my entire approach to my schedule. Like I'm not able to draw as much as I did back then. I used to draw like long hours, you know, and I thought that that was necessary in order to have the output that I needed to have. And I now have accepted that like that output is not realistic for me. And now I'm like able to create and I feel healthy and I don't struggle with that injury anymore at all. But wow. I did have to like adjust my expectations. You know, I had to let go of that myth that like I could draw all the time. Like I just can't, you know. Wow. That's a super cool revelation. I think that's amazing. Like those, in, you know, being presented with a challenge, particularly a physical challenge, it, it, it puts you through some really great trials to, to, to evolve and, and change perspective. And if you can come out of that, you know, somewhat unscathed and, and you end up learning new skills and abilities, that's yeah. super cool. Um, yeah. I was going to say, I, I, you know, I probably would speak for, for all of your followers in the art community and we're, we're all thankful that you ended up pursuing a career in art and although biology and, and philosophy all sound super fascinating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, I love the, all those fields, but you know, I was just in denial. I was like, sure. I just wanted to be an artist and I was just like scrambling for solutions that would, you know, uh, I just couldn't face the fact that like, I really wanted to be an artist and that being an artist is scary because like you are jumping in the deep end. You don't know what, what is, what your future will look like even today with like all, all the changes that have occurred and all the possibilities and the internet, like being more of like a marketplace where artists can make a living. It's still scary. Like it's not the same as be becoming a doctor and following like a certain path, you know, yeah. like, Paths are quite clearly set out for you in other fields, but in art, it's really like just <laughs> like you're thrown into a pit and it's like survive. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, truly. And and I think that's a, and, there, and those of you that are posting comments in the chat, I will make sure that we, we get to those here in a moment. But I think this is a good segue into a, a good topic that in, because you have found, I mean, outside of your incredible abilities, you found a way to utilize them in social media and within your approach to kind of being a self-made artist in a way where you kind of self-navigated your own way. So I'd love to talk about how did that journey start getting into building a career and, and do you really feel confident that it's valuable for artists to be spending more time trying to find ways to, to make a career in social media or rather using social media to have one? Um, yeah, so when I started out, I guess on DeviantArt, I guess, I, I don't know if DeviantArt, you could call that social media, um, but it was kind of like online community. Um, when I started out on DeviantArt and those little communities, like being online was like a way to get away from real life. So it was like you were often just being somebody that you wouldn't like. The, I, so like being presentable, you know, to people was like something you did in real life. And being online was like, you showed your other side, <laughs> like right. you went right. fully into like your nerdy obsessions or like weird humor, or in my case, like my Powerpuff Girls Star Wars fan art, you know, so people were just doing like embarrassing things on the internet, basically. Um, and I managed to build up a following on DeviantArt because I uh, had a couple of daily top favorites, which means that like some of my art like generated enough favorites to put it on the front page. And that kind of snowballed over time. And I think I just posted regularly for a very long time, which also helped. And then like by the time I graduated college in 2009, like it had sort of changed. Like we had Facebook, like all these big kind of tech uh, platforms had popped into existence. And I kind of like tried to bring my followers with me to the new platforms each time. And that like helped me to build up my following as well. And then by the time, I, I don't know when the influencer age began, maybe like, what I'd say like it? late, late, like 2010, 11, I feel like. Is yeah, when it really 2010. Like. Yeah, I remember there was like a, a total switch in mood. Like it went from being like internet stuff doesn't matter. And like this is where we are to like be our true weird selves to like suddenly like people had the, like internet had become real life and being presentable was something you did on the internet. Like you had to present yourself as like somebody and using the internet to kind of like make a living was like absolutely new to me. But then the influencer age came and people just got really excited about follower numbers. And I remember people being like, oh, you have this many followers. Whoa. And like being impressed by it. Whereas before, if I was like, oh, yeah, I'm on DeviantArt. I have this many followers. Like people would have no idea what I was talking about. You know, they'd be like, like, well, okay, cool. <laughs> good for you. Are those even real people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was not like not a thing. So I was really lucky, you know, very lucky that when the time came that you could use social media to generate income that I had already built a following, like not even knowing what that meant. And I think that that's why I was able to do it uh, in a way that was authentic to me because I didn't know that it meant anything, you know? So, cause if I had known from the first time that I was posting on DeviantArt that this would have an influence on my future career, I think I would have been very, like had a lot of anxiety around it and maybe not been as spontaneous or free in what I wanted to do. So, um, and then, you know, I used social media for a really long time to kind of just bring in client work because I was doing concept artwork. So con like um, studios uh, would find me through social media. So that was a really great way of doing it. And since 2020, I've had pr primarily generate my income from Patreon, um, which is like really just asking my social media followers to please support me on Patreon and offering them 
kind of exclusive content that way. So now I'd say like since 2020, I've been like fully dependent on that social media following to generate income. Uh, and so I've kind of eased into it. You know, it took me a while. Like I eased into it over time. I do think that currently social media is extremely oversaturated and it has some qualities to it that are very negative for artists because you compare yourself a lot to other people. Um, social media is designed for you to post a lot, like to post all the time and to generate a ton of content. Uh, the algorithms really favor people who are posting daily, basically. And an artist cannot do that. You know, you can't really like have that kind of output with art. So, and generating content is also very tiring. So I, I think that social media is like a marketing tool that is an option to do if marketing interests you. But I think that if it's something that like makes you feel very negative about your work or like makes you feel bad about your creative process, that it might that it's okay to step away from it. That's what yeah. I always tell people. Even though I have personally benefited enormously from social media, I just see the negative effect that it has on artists' mental health. So I never would suggest that it's a requirement. It's a helpful tool if it's something that you're up for doing, but it's really important not to take it personally and to think that like a low number of likes or response is like a negative reflection on your art because that's not always the case. It's, right. it's much more a marketing tool. It's like a different set of skills that you need to like work that system. Yeah, that's really that's a really good point. And and I think maybe just to highlight quickly for anybody watching in the description, you'll find a link to Lois Lois's website as well as uh her Patreon if if you if you aren't following her already, which I assume all of these viewers are, but of course we've got plenty of people in the magma community that I, i'm sure will be still discovering your work which is exciting um and i wanted to say too on that i'd be curious to know what you think you know coming into you know we were there at the beginning stages of when really the internet took off and then facebook and instagram and everything else blows up in you know 2008 and 2010 ish it's like full on running and then we get this big transition into it's a marketable space for artists to be able to actually develop uh, their skills and their abilities and to be able to do things like using Patreon or other sources to, to be able to fund things, GoFundMes and, you know, the, these these crowdfunding sort of tools to achieve things. It was such a, it was like a, it was like the new frontier in a way. Yeah. It felt like there was so many opportunities. And I would say as of late, to your point, as it's kind of becoming more oversaturated, what do you think, how would you I guess, how do I phrase this question? Like, what do you see, number one, how do you see that moving forward into the next 10, 15 years? And what would you, how would you like it to be? Like, what do you feel like are the good, the, the pitfalls, the good and the bad in that space? Um, well, I don't know about the next 10, 15 years. Like, I'm afraid to look even a year into the future <laughs> based on recent developments. Like, so much has changed in like the, you know, in the artist landscape with digital tools, there's like AI generated images. Now we have like all this crypto stuff that came up a couple years ago with NFT. So like the tech world is changing at an absolutely dizzying rate. And the tech world has a massive influence on the art world because because of the things that I named earlier and because like we, you know, many artists depend on digital tools and social media. So we're like kind of dealing with this landscape and it's changing at like a dizzying rate. So it's very hard to say what it will look like. So I'm very wary of making predictions. I also know that like, because there's so much learning material freely available out there. So when I was like first learning digital art, there was, there were a couple of tutorials on deviant art. But outside of that, it was very hard to like kind of learn because YouTube didn't exist or did it? I don't know. Yeah, I think YouTube existed. It like started in 2005 or something, right? Yeah, I would say around, yeah. like, around there, four or five. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like YouTube has like changed the world because like you can learn anything from YouTube, right? And there's like yeah. so much free learning content on there. And you can really tell that like the younger generation picking up art right now is learning at such a fast rate and is like starting out so much more skilled than I was. So I see like people just at a very advanced level and they're just, they're like 14, 15 years old, you know, like it's, it's so fast because they have a wealth of learning material. And I think many tools have become more accessible, more affordable. So it's like a different world. And I think that that pattern's going to continue that more and more like extremely talented people will like, and skilled people will continue to like enter the workforce. Um, 
And I think that that's like going to be a good thing for creativity in general, because we see like so much beautiful stuff being made. Um, I recently supported a Kickstarter for like an animated short for two artists that I've been following for a while, Ellie Oli, they're called. And they, um, you know, they're just like making their own animations, which like also wasn't really an option when I was first learning. Um, you know, when I was first learning animation, you can just like make your own animation at home, you know? So that yeah. these are things that are like having such a massive impact on like just the amount, the sheer amount of creativity and talent that is out there. And that is something I'm very optimistic about. And I'm optimistic about the fact that like they have more ways to generate income and be supported. But at the same time, I kind of worry about like, uh, how are you going to get noticed, you know, in today's, in today's world? Like people, there are so many talented artists that barely get seen, you know, that really struggle to, to build an audience. And so I think that like the focus might shift towards away from like these massive communities with huge numbers of people in them and more towards smaller, more intimate communities and platforms. I've already seen that happen on Discord, for example, that people, a lot of people are hanging out in Discords because people can gather around common interests and connect in a more authentic way that like feels more genuine in many ways than, um, you know, than, than social media. Uh, and I think that magma is another one of those things that's like, it allows you to really like be together in smaller groups. Like in theory, of course, large groups of people can also gather on magma, but it, in practice, like people will just gather in smaller groups and have more like intimate and friendly kind of interactions with one another. And I think that that's where it's going because out of sheer necessity, because it's like so difficult to find your clan in the oversaturated space of social media today. That's, 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 I think that's really wise and great insight in, in, and it does seem to be, you know, the, the, the transition in digital arts and in seeking to do it for other companies and other things does seem to be changing where, you know, the interjection of just more tools on the technical level makes things so much more, so much easier to achieve now with, you know, used to take, yeah you know, 10 times as many people as it does now to do an it to do a film or to create a game or to do a thing i mean it's yeah. it games in particular still are, are massive teams of people uh, same for films but then you get amazing pieces of content that people are putting out and creating online that don't get you know they don't sell on platforms or don't go into movie theaters but are just as amazing and incredible i i definitely hope and see that there is that transition where the, the uh, we as people as we integrate deeper and deeper with connection in, in the internet will continue to do more on our own which to your point kind of points to the the, the bigger value of of you know magma being a communal tool for art where pe large groups or small groups or any size of groups can formulate and, and connect together and other tools yeah. that do the same like discord uh, I, i'd be curious to know and i know there's a few more questions that a, a bunch of people were asking about your art that i want to make sure that i get to but maybe to kind of just keep segueing until we get through some of these topics the I'd love to know a, a bit about how you were introduced to Magma and where you're finding value in it in some of your pursuits with your site and with your community. Um, so I was introduced to it through schoolism because I know that um, when, um, I don't remember exactly, I think it, I, I can't pin the exact date, but I believe that like when COVID hit and there were like more online um, activities, like uh, Lightbox went to an online version and there were like these cool magma drawing sessions that people did together. And I remember being so moved by that because it was really like uh, the feeling of community that I had truly been missing, you know, after many months of lockdown. So it was, it was a very special feeling to feel like we were all together, even though we weren't sharing a physical space. Um, and that's how I was kind of introduced to the tool. And I remember like instantly feeling connected with it because I grew up with, uh, you know, internet drawing communities uh, using like these kind of tools. So I used uh, this thing called Oikaki BBS, which is like Japanese for doodle. And it's like, oh, it was a really simple program to just draw quick little doodles and post that to a board. And there was also a thing called Open Canvas, which was like you could draw together on a canvas, like you could connect to it and, 
And so I, I remembered that, you know, from the good old days. <laughs> so I heard about Magma and I was like, that's just like open canvas. And then I checked it out and I saw that it was like significantly more advanced than any of those tools. Like it's very, it's, it's very like advanced interface. Like you can make quite elaborate artwork with it. Um, and then when I set up my Patreon and Discord, so last year I decided, you know, because I'd been doing my Patreon for a couple of years, but it was very low key. It was really just like one low tier and just posting some content uh, and, a, and a tutorial every month. And then last year I was like, I felt like I wasn't getting to know my patrons that well. Like I felt like there was, I, that there was like something there, like this this deeper level that I wasn't getting to. So I started a Discord community where we can all chat and share stuff and I where I post challenges and like where we really draw together. So the focus is on really like creating a place where people can get together and talk about art and talk about their growth. Cause I know how important that is for artists. You know, it's, it's for me, like without communities, I just wouldn't be where I am. It's that feeling of doing it together, right? Yeah. So. I wanted to create that for my patrons and of course like it was just a no-brainer to include a uh, magma board and magma community and now we're going to start doing um we're going to start doing monthly theme jams and drawing together and i know that like magma has like so much potential because i've gotten a couple of demos where i can see how i can do like a live drawing session on there for example with like audio and video like there's so it's it's such an incredibly powerful tool for anybody who like works with art communities in any way, shape or form. So that's how I got to know it. And that's like, I'm just really excited to be able to use it to cultivate more of that, like together feeling. That's very cool to hear. I mean, the, the Okaki, am I saying it correctly? The Okaki board? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I even know if I'm saying it correctly because it's a Japanese <laughs> word, right? <laughs> yeah, it, but the the connection to that, and I think you know the history of like those tools and and where Magma is now, it's it is really interesting. And what we love is to see people like yourself, you know, seeking to use it for those reasons. That's really the the inception of the tool is really about community and collaboration more so than about being the most sophisticated, you know, platform to, to, to do illustration and design and to do all the things we care more about the community and the collaboration aspect as of right now and what we're focusing on. So I think the way that you use it and the way that your community engages with it is in incredible for us to see. And we're doing those things on our side all the time, hosting, hosting live streams and just jumping in and setting a topic and drawing together and just talking like this, you know, and, and yeah. being able to hang out. It just, it points to, <clears throat> And just the, the number of people that are interested in those things, it points to that there is a deeper need for artists to be able to engage with each other on this level and not just about, I mean, what you are doing, the Patreon, the tutorials, the education, the higher level stuff, that's incredibly crucial. And this is just another channel or facet of that journey, you know, that process. Yeah, definitely. And it's always, it's just, it is like, you know, just in terms of like getting artists together to really like draw and talk together and like be able to see each other's process. It's not like, it used to be like easy to find that kind of stuff, but it's not really like a given, you know, you have to really look for a platform that facilitates it really. And that facilitates like you know, because you have Twitch, you have like streaming platforms that allow like one person to basically stand on a stage and be like, watch me and then gain an audience. But like that feeling of like, we're all doing it together is not that easy to create, you know, in today's internet landscape. And I think that Magma does do that. Like it creates kind of like a, you know, literally a blank canvas that anyone can join in, which is like, it's, it's difficult to, to find that these days. And that that's why it's really important, I think. That's great. And one of the things that we're doing recently that I, I imagine that you'll probably dip into is uh, focusing on education, being able to, instead of it being just a person doing their style and their work and teaching somebody else how to do it, we're running educational magma classroom streams that are allowing people to jump in. We'll have a professional or a host that that's going through a topic, but everybody gets to participate and be there on the canvas and ask questions and, and get direct feedback right away. That part has been super fun and engaging and just just very enjoyable. It's like, it's a very joyful process to just kind of be there and be a part of and to observe. So I, I, I hope, I hope that, you know, in those areas you'll be able to make use of in, in all kinds of different ways. And 
Um, I feel like in, in this case for, you know, moving on from some of these other topics on, on the Magma side, there was a few questions in here that I wanted to highlight just on your work, because I want to make sure there's tons of fans and followers that I think want to get a deeper understanding of your process. One of them was, uh, how do you bring flow in your art? What's your mindset while drawing poses? Yeah. So because I'm like not very technical, like I mentioned earlier, and because I kind of like don't really think too much about getting things right, because I literally am not good at that. Uh, I try to just focus on gesture and movement first and foremost. So I have a lot of like, I guess, anatomical inaccuracies in my work, but I feel like as long as it serves the message, like as long as it looks like it's alive and moving, then it's okay. And I think that's also something I learned from animation because I remember like this was like a big, like mind blown moment when I was like first in animation school was learning how like in betweens can be really weird. So like sometimes you have like one keyframe that's like this and another that's like that. And then the middle keyframe is like the hand completely stretched, right? And it doesn't look correct at all. But then when you watch the animation, it's like this like kind of cool movement. And that taught me that like accuracy doesn't actually matter that much. It's about like the feeling, you know, like does it communicate what you want it to? So I'm always thinking about how I can just capture some movement and keep things loose and free and like not overthink accuracy too much. I feel like the accuracy will come later, like not just in your drawing process, but in your growth process, like it'll come later, but it's not the highest priority. So that's, that's how I find flow, just keeping it loose and just letting it go a little bit. That's great. Do you use any kind of uh, posing or reference tools? Like, do you have just a maybe a mannequin or do you just put it on paper or put it on screen? I use reference. So there are like a couple of reference sources that are like really helpful to me, but I use them mostly. So a Dorka stock, I always have to like do a shout out to a Dorka stock because she has such a wide range of references. And I'm always using them. But uh, I use them mostly for studies uh, or for getting things right. But I try to do poses off the top of my head, like from my imagination for my paintings, because that like will allow me to feel more free. Like right. that allows me to just like play around with what I'm trying to get instead of like feeling stuck on detail. So whenever I do use reference, I do find myself stuck in a loop of like, but it's not accurate. This thing is a little off. Or, like wanting to make it exactly like the reference, which really blocks my creativity and it creates stiffness in, in the work. So I try to like do as much as I can from the imagination and then bring in the reference at the very end for the stuff that I really can't do off the top of my head. Yeah, that's really great. And I think that goes back to, you know, some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, which maybe we didn't mention it in this regard, but I was thinking as you were talking about this, like the, it is kind of about, you, you have to, uh, it's like, you got to take the training wheels off at some point, you know, yeah. you got to build your confidence and by associating, I can relate to this by relying on reference, relying on something too much and needing it to be perfect. You're not giving yourself enough control of the ship to, to, to be making intentional decisions like you want to set yourself up to, and even if maybe you don't make them correctly the first few times at least you're trying you're not staring at the reference and just copying on page you're 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 the pilot of the ship you take more control in that regard right yes i feel that one really because i as all well, like taking the training wheels off is something good to do in the beginning but like that's something i'm actually like struggling with a lot right now because as I've become more comfortable with my workflow and tried to push. So I, in the last two years, ever since I started the Patreon, I've really pushed to try and like kind of improve my technical skills. So I picked up a couple of new workflows and started like really like when making paintings, trying to push myself just that bit further and bringing in more reference and being like, but how can I exaggerate this specific thing? How does this look in real life? And I became more dependent on reference as those years went by. And now I'm at a point where I'm like back to square one. Like I need to let that reference go a little more. So mm -hmm. I'm challenging myself to do more like off the top of my head, to do more like loose and free stuff from the imagination and come up with a couple of poses like out of nowhere, which is something that like I, I lost touch with as I was focusing more on 
pushing my technical skills. So it, I think that that's so fun about the creative process, right? It's never linear. It's like this constant, like up and down, like ebb and flow of different yeah. aspects of it. Well, I think that's good for people to hear. Somebody with your incredible skill level. I mean, I, I we're talking and I'm just kind of also mesmerized by watching and looking at all these images. I I put these together last night and I wanted to use like all like hundreds of them, but I just couldn't make a video short enough to cover it. But this idea of like somebody at your level who still goes through this process like this, you, you've reached a stage where like you also want to evolve and you're presented with these challenges and yeah but i feel like the more secure you become in your skill set and the more you start to think like well i've got a style and i've got a skill set that i'm happy with the more like by the time you reach that point your attention will shift to completely different things like it's in human nature i think to like never be like well i'm here and i'm staying here forever you know what i mean like we always right. want to keep moving and and our ideas like our perception of uh of of what we like and what interests us changes as our skills develop as well like so that that's why i think art is like it's like an um how do you i want to say bottomless well <laughs> bottomless pit that sounds very negative but like it's like this endless <laughs> source endless source of like new ideas it never stops you know which is yeah. why i think i think if you allow yourself to kind of go with the flow of your creativity and like accept that your growth takes twists and turns you don't expect that you can draw forever and it can stay yeah. exciting and interesting like your entire life, you know? Yeah, that's so true. I, I was watching a great, I was watching Stutz on Netflix the other day and and it was, it's a lot about self growth and, and learning tools to be able to evaluate yourself. But they use an, a reference or an example, a tool, which is this idea of being trapped in a maze. And, and you can be, uh, to your point on human nature, we all have this, that that is human nature, right? We, 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 yeah. we always look, we, we're always moving up, we're moving forward. We don't look too far into the future, but we're always trying to do things differently. We never stop and, and stand still for too long, mo collectively, right? Some of us yeah. have this ability more than others, but this idea that that's always innate in, 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 in you, I've, I feel like that the pursuit of happiness in whatever regard to be able to appreciate and have positive feedback loops kind of requires you to set yourself up in a way to be able to successfully go on that journey and keep growing. And, and so many of us are trapped in that maze where we have the same wants and desires as everybody else, but we don't know how to get there. And we're, and we're yeah. maybe in the maze longer than others. And sometimes even the best of us also get pulled back into that maze, but the tools yeah. that you learn on your journey is self-discovery, you know, self-awareness, uh, you know, setting realistic goals, you know, all these things are so important because it, you then you get to set yourself up for a, a pathway that you will continue to learn and, and knowing that it's going to, there's going to come a time, you know, even, even the best of us have to go through a phase where we got to go back to the drawing board and maybe learn a few new things and, and go yeah. through the pitfalls of not being yeah, great because, at it. Yeah. Cause I always want to say like growth isn't linear. You know, I think that when you look at somebody from the outside, it can look linear, right? It can look like, oh, that person is here and this is a step they took to get there. So it is a linear process and this is where I am on this line. But in reality, it's it's not linear at all. It's a, it's more of like a change, you know? It's like a, a morphing, like an evolution of that's what leads you forward, not like right. a, a path from point A to point B. And I think that that's why it's important. Like, that's why it's also good to accept that everyone has different ways of learning, different sets of limitations. Like limitations are definitely a part of that process, like accepting dealing with our limitations, you know? Like I, I, I used to think that growth was very like a linear thing, point A to point B. And that like the more hours and the more effort you put in, the closer you'll get to like your final point where you've, succeeded but that yeah. led me to becoming injured <laughs> because i was working too hard you know so right. that that showed me that it's not like linear it's very much like um yeah it's it's, it's really more of a, a morphing and evolution of our ideas than it is yeah. like uh, a race you know and that it's, that it, it's such that a cliche point. like it sounds like a platitude but i really believe that no, I, I actually was really fortunate to talk with Richard Taylor uh, from What a Workshops years ago. And one of the things that he talked about at, at their studio in terms of what they what they kind of focus on collectively from a high level is that it's, it, it is a race. This concept of like going through and creating amazing sculptures and artwork and visual effects and all these things. 
it, they treat it like a race and it it's not a sprint it is it's a it's cross country it is a long right. journey and, and it's about yeah. pacing yourself and knowing that and the crazy thing is is even for artists we kind of you know i i know what it's what it must be like for you having experienced physical limitations because you don't think you'll know, say like, i'm not a manual i'm not out working in manual labor i'm sitting at home i'm using a cintiq but even that offers yeah. physical limitations if you push yourself too much and, and not to mention the stress and the mental stuff i feel like that yeah. has the biggest effect for for us you know yeah definitely and it's also like a thing of like I feel like if you're very goal oriented, you can get hyper focused on that. I'm definitely a goal oriented person. So I, you know, if I set a goal for myself, that can become like everything to me. You know, I'm just thinking about how to get to that goal. But then we forget like everything around it. And that's what happened to me when I got like overly, you know, and I was working too much on art because I forgot like, <laughs> you know, the rest of my life. Like I forgot to have work life balance, to have like things not that eating, are fulfilling. Not sleeping, just working, yeah, working, just, yeah focusing only on the work but like you cannot get fulfillment out of anything in your life unless you are also like healthy uh, to the extent that you're able to be that right and like rested and you know that you've worked on other aspects of your life and I was like only working on art for a very long time and actually like that's how it started out for me like art was my escape Right. And then I just fully immersed myself into it and I lost touch with other parts of my life. So, you know, in the aftermath of that injury, I really learned how to just put prioritize my health a little more. And I think that for every person that looks different, like I'm not a health evangelist that will tell you, like, you should be doing this routine or eating like that because everyone is different. Right. But like to me, health is just like when you decide to prioritize your well-being, you know, and that's something that I wasn't doing. Um, and I needed to do that. And then I could enjoy the art and find time for the art. Right. And that, mm -hmm. that is, that's, that's, I think the part that like very motivated artists, uh, forget sometimes, and that will lead you to hit a wall eventually. Like you have to balance your artistic goals out with like, you know, just other goals in your life that are, just as important and then allow you to keep drawing. So it's yeah. ironic because the reason that I started working on my well-being more is because I wanted to keep drawing. So uh -huh. in the end, the drawing is the end goal for me, but it allowed right. me to also work on other stuff too. That's super cool, but that's it just ties into <laughs> everything so well. That really puts a bow on it. And I, I Tanya had a question earlier about reconnecting with your own creativity when you feel lost or not happy with your art. How do you find motivation? It sounds like a lot of these things that we're talking about are really this is this is really where it starts from. Would you add anything to that? I would say like for me, one of the main things that has helped, and that's just for me personally, is uh, to get away from other art. <laughs> so a lot of there are a lot of people out there who get like a ton of influence from art, like feel inspired from it, and that motivates them. And sometimes that it does that for me as well. But sometimes I get like uh, inspiration overload from looking at too much other art and I compare myself to other people constantly and I, fall, I find myself falling short of, of them regularly. And then I find like when I disconnect from other artistic influences, like when I just stop looking on social media as much and I stop looking at like who does it better and who's made, who's creating more and who does, who has created this image, but then like a billion times better than I ever could. Like when I shut out those influences and just allow myself to like be in my own creativity within my own limitations as well. So like getting away from reference also helps me to do that because then I'm like, whoa, I'm drawing this really wonky but it's okay. You know, I try to let it go. That usually brings my creativity back because I allow myself to just explore the ideas that I want to explore rather than thinking about how somebody else did it better. Uh, but for some people, it could be the opposite, right? Like everyone, right. for some people, like getting out of your own head and looking at other people's art could be what brings back your inspiration. But for me, I found that it's the opposite, maybe because I'm just on social media so much. I would say that that probably makes sense. It, it, there's it, like there's so many different walks of life and different perspectives, but the the reasons to shift out of those things are always the same. It's just a matter of seeing it that way. And yeah, it, it's you know I I think about it like this all the time. The 
you know, if you believe in the, the, the concept or the idea of evolution that we are evolving, you know, we, we kind of got thrown into this, this like crazy digital frontier, like this digital age, like within our lifetime, we went from no internet, no computers to like computers yeah. and living on them. And so it, it's like, it's talked about, it's such a cliche thing to say these days, but it's still so uh, in, apparent. And this idea of like being so connected with people on social media, the, the side effects of that are still being understood and discovered. So, you know, it's from your perspective, it sounds like that's definitely a byproduct of just seeing so, so much, you know, and you can't, yeah, you can't, it, it's hard to rationalize and, and you just need to step away from it for a little bit to gain perspective. And then you come back and you feel a little bit better about it, I'm sure. I haven't actually thought of it in that term, but I actually think that that is exactly it. I think that it's like just the constant information overload that exists in today's age that like when I was, you know, a teenager, <laughs> it really feels like I'm talking about like the 18th century at this stage. I know. But, <laughs> 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 but I was like getting my inspiration from just like, you know, a book Books. my parents gave me and I would just look in the book and find something that I liked. And I, I had such a limited amount of information coming my way in terms of like artistic influence. And that really helped me find focus, just having like a handful of just like in passionate influences. And these days I feel quite scatterbrained, you know, in terms of where I wanna go. Like I wanna do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I don't have like this intense focus anymore. And that might also have to do with my age, you know, like you just experience things differently as a teenager than when you're 37. But mm -hmm. I also think that like in today's age, it might be more valuable to get away from information than to seek out more of it because like you can fall into like these rabbit holes. And so social media is designed at the end of the day to make you feel terrible about yourself. You know, it's like, it's made to like, it's a, it's a comparison model. It's a way of like, oh, that person got more likes or whatever. It's very quantifiable and therefore you can easily fall short, you know? Right. So it's good to protect ourselves from it and see it for what it is, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope, you know, I hope that in so much has changed from that perspective in terms of how we saw it when it, when it began, you know, for us, it was like high school, you know, the high school age and getting into college, it was like really taking off. And then now that so we went through the a whole spectrum of transformations, like everybody loved it. Now we're, we're, there's a lot of people that are being vocal about their experiences in, in spending more time in social media. Parents are spending more time, you know, disconnecting their kids from some of these tools because they see the benefit and the need. If you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, maybe there will come a, a point in time, maybe this is exponentially increasing our rate of evolution and we'll figure out a way to integrate with these tools more easily and without, maybe. yeah, maybe, <laughs> but you know, it's, I, I think it, it's just a matter of, it's a lot of time. It takes a whole lot of time. And yeah. the last 20 years has been it feels like we've been in a time warp because so many yeah. things are coming up and new things are happening all the time. We can't even, it's like we get a new thing and we get excited about it and we've already got another new thing that we got to figure out how yeah. we feel about, you know? Yeah. And it's weird. Cause like even in the last three years, I feel like it's even ramped up more. So it's, it is, it's hard to wrap my brain around it. And sometimes getting away from it is like lately I've been drawing a lot of like kind of techie illustrations, but then with like, very thick cables and wires and like very physical tech. Cause like I find myself kind of like drawn to a time where all of that stuff was physical. Cause like now it's all very, how do you say? It's like very invisible. Right. <laughs> the, like the way that these things influence us, you know, like algorithms determine so much of, of my life as a social media artist and other social media artists, you know, like algorithms are deciding so much, but what even is an algorithm? Like it doesn't even have a face, you know, like we don't know, right. like these social media platforms sometimes can't even explain it. And these algorithms kind of determine what kind of artistic inspiration lands on my feed as well, which is I think why I feel very scattered about my inspirations, because it's like a, a mix that I don't know who decided that this was going to end up on my path, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and in, in some ways it's comparable to like, I don't think it's changed that radically from when I was a kid because I also got kind of random influences back then. But it is it does change your relationship with inspiration. And I think it it it's for young people, I worry about how much they're going to find themselves falling short of other people because of the comparison model that social media has. So I always 
like I, I feel hypocritical because I benefit enormously from social media, but I do advise people to like take valuable time away from it as much as they can in order to replenish their self-esteem and reconnect with their own creativity or move yeah. to like little smaller communities. Like we were mentioning earlier, like the discord, the magma spaces, you know, like places where you yeah. can just connect with real people. I was, I was going to say to follow up with that, exactly that it sound that that's something that I hope it's, I love being a part of this, this magma journey because it is about, I feel very personally connected to this industry and these transformations and these things. And, and when I hear you talk about your, your perspective on what it's like being this inundated in social media, it's, it's, you know, we don't, we don't, we never, we never do the same thing. We, well, we do, we do repeat a lot of the same mistakes in history, but we, we change things ever so slightly and we keep trying to make modifications and improvements. This is one that I think from just from the creative, the artistic community, talking to, to those people, you know, our watchers and the people that are interested in these same things that you are. I think that this is one of those great revolutionary times where the, the the these creative spaces are starting to crump up these smaller communities that you're describing you know using tools like magma and discord and building your your space we're, we're actually seeing a need for it and people are starting yeah. to wake up to this idea that we don't really want to keep we, we tried it out we did the social media thing we did the like system and it just doesn't it's not a positive feedback loop in the ways that make us better. It makes our lives a bit more complicated and harder to navigate. So we need to, to take action and, and be more selective about the things that we do and, and like have confidence in that, you know, we don't want these things anymore. We'd rather have a more enriching creative environment where we all can collaborate and work together or, you know, figure out what it is that we need. But all these tools exist. It's just a matter of, you know, learning to to take advantage of them. And that's what I love about what you're doing. Your 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 site and your Patreon and, and this focus that you're doing is and somebody commented earlier um how a tangerine chant how uplifting it is to hear um hearing an artist that you admire also struggling and wanting to find something else to learn. I think that it's awesome for people to hear this because we're all kind of going through this and we're all kind of figuring out what's the next step and what you're doing is offering your your skills and your abilities and it's also supporting you but that to me is that's the that's what people love i mean crowdfunding and patreons like you no longer need to rely on you know superficial income or or a company you can do something with i would say altruistic purposes you're trying to do something yeah. and give back in a positive way and it's just so incredible to observe and and see how many people are interested in that as well Thank you. Yeah, that has given me like intense fulfillment. I have to say, like, on one hand, I really like drawing, but drawing alone, it wouldn't be enough. I think it's also like being able to connect with other artists and share knowledge that has, has been much more fulfilling for me. And I am very lucky, like, it's not pure altruism, of course, because it is my income model, you know, but I do like I'm lucky that I'm able to generate income from that, because that makes me truly happy. And that that's the stuff that like you know makes you feel human uh when when artists uh, and i think it's it's cool that somebody in the that that um the comment that you mentioned earlier that they said like it's cool to see you struggling with stuff as well because it's like i feel like that is like the the universal language real talk language of artists it's like we mm -hmm. all connect and we're like oh you're struggling too oh my god we're all struggling with this thing because like artists can be so insecure and like cut off from one another and it's really important to just normalize like conversations around like struggling with our skill set and not knowing what to do and like what to learn and and how how do we overcome the things that we learned in art school you know a lot of people who went there learned some things that they had to unlearn later and that's that's i think why community is so important to art i think that it's just it's just what it's what keeps your creativity going and what keeps you grounded i think so right. i'm i'm really lucky that i've been able to find a community like that and and be able to share learning content because that's what makes me so happy that's so cool. That's so exciting to hear. I mean, that that's the human interaction is incredibly important. I think that's something that we ultimately yeah. always need. Sharing your artwork in a post and getting a bunch of likes feels good, but it doesn't last. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. fulfill the pillar of, you know, human needs, which is, you know, the mind, body and social connections are whether we like it or not, it's a part of who we are. And you can't deny that, you know, you, you got to set yourself up to be able to receive those things uh, in whatever way you can. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, okay. One last question, uh, and 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 we'll let you go because I don't want to take too much more of your time. Although I do love these conversations <laughs> so much. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, Coravania, uh, do you find yourself wanting to return to more traditional mediums of art as technology progresses and is being perceived more uh, destructive in some cases? Good question. Ooh, yeah, I um, I sometimes do. Like I've, I've, I've dabbled in traditional media uh, from time to time and was shocked to discover that some of my digital skills can be translated to traditional, which kind of felt like that moment in the matrix, you know, where he like downloads skills into his head and then he like uses it, it in real life or like- Gosh, you know, that I, kind of... I always wished that that was real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet, after talking about all these things, though, it kind of proves that that would actually probably not be good for us because it is about the journey and True. the fulfillment of learning it. And to just get it would be like I, yeah. we'd be unhappy, right? <laughs> yeah, your brain would just be like an unnavigatable database of just factoids. <laughs> it would be out of yeah. control. Um, yeah. So, like, I um, I do think that like I like traditional. Um, so I, I do want to do it more. And when I picture myself in the distant future, like, you know, retired, I just picture myself like painting, making oil paintings of bouquets and like, like plein airs and stuff, like just, you know, having like a visceral experience of art, like just painting nature with, with traditional tools. So that's something that I yearn for on some level. But I, digital art is like so, um, like such a part of what I do. It's, it's so deep. Like I learned how to draw with digital media. So my, my skill level was like not, it was just like quite amateuristic. Uh, you know, I hadn't learned a lot of the fundamentals or the basics. And then I did end up learning that all in Photoshop or in the Okaki program. So it wasn't like... Uh, they're just interwoven, you know, my whole experience of art is interwoven with digital tools. And my workflow is so much about just letting things go. And the reason that I'm able to do that is because of digital, like you can just change things as you go, you can undo you can, you know, I've changed like my entire color scheme halfway through the painting process quite a lot. I just use the color editing tools to completely throw it around. Um, and I feel like the reason that I've been able to have kind of like a you know, everything will be fine. Just go with the flow attitude is because digital media facilitates that a lot. So it's it's so interwoven with my perception of art that I think I would have a hard time stepping away from it. Yeah. But there is a place for traditional media, you know, in my heart. So <laughs> I will be going there more in the future. But uh, digital art is like my my first artistic love. And I'll never be able to let that go. <laughs> yeah, which totally makes sense. I mean, it, it is fascinating. I've gone from doing, you know, learning digital sculpture first and then going back to practical or traditional and doing maquettes and like, holy crap. I mean, it's like symmetry. Nope. You got to do everything authentically and <laughs> everything that you do. There's no control Z. There's no undo. There's no, yeah. it's like you have to almost plot out your, your route before you start. Yeah. You got to go. Okay, yeah. That is a way. massive difference, isn't it? That you have to like plan ahead more, which is just a different, that, that in itself is like a different skill set mentally. Yeah. It's a nice sentiment though, to think, you know, doing it later in life, you know, as, as we get older and maybe taking a step back and like starting something new, it would be, it, it would be great to validate the, the, the usage of these art forms or the creation of the tools themselves that are, they're still valuable, you know, the practical is still being done. People are still doing traditional art forms yeah. and it, it's, it's like another adventure to start whenever you're ready. Exactly. I do like that. There's all these things like existing side by side. And I do think about like, if I, I think if I were to draw with zero pressure, because I do have pressure now, like I do think about like my output, you know, cause I have to keep up with social media and, and I do like, you know, I, w I work at a certain pace that just I've adapt I've gotten used to as a working artist, but there's going to be a day where that pace doesn't matter anymore. At least I hope so. <laughs> like the grind <laughs> can't go on forever. And, and then I think about like what I would care about artistically. Like, I think I would just be excited about trying new things at that stage. I would just want to be like, well, what happens if I mix these colors? Oh, you know, and then if it doesn't work out, it's like, it doesn't matter. So I picture my relationship with art, like transforming completely when that pressure falls away. But I don't know, maybe that's kind of a naive dream as well. 
I have no idea how it'll work out. I'll get back to you when I'm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I will definitely look forward to, to finding out more about that in the future. I think about those things all the time. As you say, it's future like. Future updates will follow. <laughs> Well, and you know, on this path or journey that you're on now, and 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 you know, putting yourself out there the way that you are, and, and building a brand around your name and your art, you know, this it's a it's a brave thing to do. You know, it takes a lot of courage to to put your put yourself and your artwork out there, and and be willing to be seen by so many people, and dealing with, I'm sure, all kinds of stuff that comes in from that. A lot of love. I, I mean, very obviously, your community is very strong. And I think that that pretty much comes down to just the authenticity of you and your work and, and that it's not about, you know, it's it's for mutual gain. You know, you get as much out of this as they do when they get to observe you, you know, doing your thing, which is super cool to see. Thanks. I do feel that. I feel my patrons are always, are always thanking me, but I'm always like, no, thank you. <laughs> but I really mean <laughs> it because <laughs> you know, I get a lot out of it, too. And right. outside of Patreon as well, there's plenty like I try to share free knowledge as well and like kind of give art tips on social media and getting like the feedback from that. It's it's so rewarding. It's it's really like my pleasure in the end. That's cool. On, on the topic of thanks, Sandrine Chen is thanked for the live stream has provided a lot of insight into the thought process of digital illustration and through the lens of an artist and their journey. We thank you for your questions, Tangerine, and everyone. You guys have been so great. And uh, hopefully we've been able to get to all the major topics and things I was doing my best to keep an eye on the comments. Um, Lois, I, I do want to, before we go, because I, I, I don't take any more of your time, but the I'd love to. Is there anything that's going on in your world? Anything that you'd like to share? We have your site, your Patreon in the description of YouTube. Any events or things that you'd like to announce to, to our viewers? Hmm. Well, uh, so my Patreon is like, I can really recommend it for like, if you are willing to, you know, um, join a Patreon. Uh, I really, we, we do like community stuff. So we, I have like monthly challenges and we also have like drawing together in the magma art space. And we have just like some fun. We have like a community art room where people can hang out. And I think that that just connects a lot with the conversations that we've had, you know, during this, this conversation <laughs> is that like, community is important. And I try to create that with a Patreon. So that's something that I always would recommend. Um, and as far as events go, like, I think that um, I'm just so excited that art events are happening again, you know, so I'm going to be at playgrounds this year, playgrounds um, is a Dutch event. So there's one in Eindhoven in Berlin. And I'm also going to be at Lightbox, probably most likely, because it's cool. my favorite we event. And I, I think that that's something that magma attends as well, right? So absolutely. That's definitely something that like I would recommend checking out if you're able to, because connecting with artists in real life is also a very meaningful experience. So those are things that I can advise. Um, but for the rest, like I just recommend checking out Magma and seeing what you can do with it because it is a lot of fun. I appreciate you so much, Lois. This has been such a fun and awesome conversation. The The information is in, available in the description and you can join our Discord, which is also available below. We will be, I'm definitely going to be sharing as much information on events that you've got going on, Lois, and and uh, within our community. So anybody who's maybe not fully aware of what's going on or how to access this stuff, join our Discord in the description. You know, there's also a link to join Magma directly if you'd like to sign up for free. And uh, yeah, we're going to be doing tons of stuff. Maybe, Lois, we could do some sort of like collaboration stream or something in the future. That would be super fun. Definitely cool well thank you lois it's been so much fun talking with you and uh we'll look forward to to keeping in touch soon yeah thank you so much for having me it was our pleasure thank you everyone for watching and uh cheers have a great week and we'll see you next time in the magma podcast <laughs>